There's a moment in history that hits you like a blast of warm air from a wood stove, the kind that makes you stop, lean in, and think, wait, how did we lose this? Because, you know, buried in the chaos of the 1940s, during the grit and grind of World War II, people were heating homes, barracks, and field shelters with a trick so efficient, so stubbornly reliable, that today's power-hungry systems don't even come close. And the wild part? It ran without electricity, without pumps, without fancy thermostats, just raw physics and smart design that kept people alive when failure wasn't an option. Let's dive straight into the heart of this thing. No fluff, no warm-up phase. You want value? You'll get it. One of the most overlooked heating techniques of the 1930s and 1940s was passive thermal siphoning. This wasn't theory. This was the kind of engineering that kept farmhouses warm in the dead of winter and made remote outposts survivable during wartime. The idea was brutally simple. Heat rises, cool water sinks. So why not design a system that lets hot water circulate itself? The layout went like this. Your firebox sits low usually at floor level or even below it. Above that, you position a water tank or coil so the rising heat hits it directly. From there, a slight upward slope in the pipes allows the water to rise through the system, release its heat into the rooms, then sink back down to the stove to be reheated. No electricity, no moving parts, no pump to fail at 3 a.m. during a storm. And here's where method becomes practice. You can actually replicate this in an off-grid cabin or survival shelter today, just by using a basic wood stove and a gravity-fed loop made from copper or steel pipe. You only need a few centimetres of rise for every metre of pipe to keep the circulation going. Once the loop is running, it's nearly impossible to stop unless you let the fire go cold for several hours. Even after the flames die down, the water in the system keeps releasing heat, sort of like a thermal flywheel. Modern radiators just can't touch that. If you unplug the pump in a modern hydronic system, the whole thing collapses instantly. But the 1940s version? Well, it just keeps going. Another reason these old systems work so well is, honestly, thermal mass. Today's heating technology loves thin aluminum, lightweight fins, and quick-reacting materials. But the 1940s couldn't care less about fast heat. They wanted lingering heat. Slow heat. The kind of heat that stuck around when the firewood started running low. Cast iron radiators were the workhorses of the era. Rural homes used clay, brick, stone, and sometimes even sand filled chambers to store massive amounts of thermal energy. Instead of creating a burst of heat that disappears in minutes, thermal mass behaves like a battery. It charges slowly, it releases slowly, it protects you from the highs and the lows. You can apply this same principle right now. Build masonry around your stove. Surround a heat source with brick benches. Place a couple of steel barrels filled with water next to a wood stove in a hunting cabin. These barrels will absorb excess heat when the fire's roaring and radiate warmth for hours afterward. It's primitive, sure, but it works reliably, predictably, and without fail. 
Thermal mass doesn't care about power outages. It doesn't care about frozen pumps. It just holds heat because physics always shows up for work. While thermal siphoning handled the water, convection channels handled the air. And this is where the 1940s got creative. Builders crafted channels behind walls, under floors, even inside stove surrounds. These channels pulled cold air from the floor, heated it as it travelled past the hot stove or chimney surface, and released it near the ceiling or across adjacent rooms. The movement was automatic. A natural upward draft created a constant airflow cycle. You didn't need a fan. You didn't need ducts. You just needed a controlled pathway. In Scandinavian regions, hidden wall cavities with brick baffles created slow, gentle heat circulation. In the United States, wooden shrouds around stoves directed warm air toward sleeping areas. In Britain, engineers used through draft warmers to pull icy floor air into a heated chamber and push it back out evenly distributed. You can, you know, recreate this today with a simple stove shroud. Just build a metal or wooden cover around your wood stove with a small gap. Really, two to four inches is enough. Now, cut a vent at the bottom so cold air can pull in, and add another vent near the top so warm air can escape. When the stove heats up, you'll hear that low whoosh of air drafting upward on its own. That single modification can, honestly, increase your stove's real-world heat output dramatically without using a single extra log. Combine all three components, thermal siphoning, thermal mass, and convection, and you end up with a system that's, well, nearly impossible to beat for reliability. Modern heating relies on the grid. It relies on pumps and controls and electronics that fail when you need them most. The 1940s system relies on physics baked directly into the structure. It's steady. It's quiet. It's self-powered. It keeps working when everything else gives out. For survivalists, this isn't nostalgia. It's strategy. For historians, it's a reminder that wartime engineering often produced solutions born from necessity, not convenience. And, you know, those solutions tend to endure. Start small, add thermal mass around your stove, build a convection sleeve. If you're living off grid, construct a simple gravity-fed hot water loop. These are not museum pieces. They're practical, real tools that people used every day in the 1940s, and they still perform. If you value history with real-world impact, methods that stood strong through war, winter, and scarcity, keep digging with us. Scene 2. Subscribe and share. And if this breakdown gave you something worth thinking about today, don't leave without subscribing to History HQ and sharing this with someone who appreciates forgotten techniques that still outclass modern tech.